political ideology should have nothing to do with good public health principles. It sort of hits you like a Mack truck, the data. You can't deny it. And like I said, it's painful to me to see that there were more hospitalizations and deaths among people who live in red states than in blue states. That should never, ever have happened. One of the things that comes through in your book is that as a country, we don't understand very well how science works, that science isn't just presenting us with an answer with a bow on it, that science is a process. And um, some of the, the accusations that, that members of Congress came up with were, well, he told us to not to wear masks, and he told us to wear masks, and then he said this and that, and it was grossly misleading. Is this something that people have put their faith in science, especially medical and biological science, without really understanding how it works? I think you put your finger right on it, Pat. It's an it's, it's a understandable but unfortunate lack of full appreciation of what the scientific process is. Science is a process that allows you, at least in the biomedical sciences, to gather information, data, and evidence that will allow you to make recommendations or guidelines or suggestions to preserve the public health. When you're dealing with a moving target, the way we dealt with over the years that we had the real intensity of COVID from the very beginning of 2020, right through the next few years, that we were getting new information. And science, by definition, is self-correcting. Because if you gather information in January or February of 2020, and that information changes six months, a year later. If you're being true to the science, you will use the self-correcting uh, phenomenon of science to be able to make changes to adjust your recommendations and your guidelines according to the currently available data. Sometimes the general public doesn't fully appreciate that. It's understandable how they might not appreciate that because they generally think of science as immutable and absolutely absolute. If something is true today, then tomorrow, if something changes, then why are you changing your mind? And the way I simply explain it to some people, Pat, is to say that that's the case perhaps with the physical sciences, the mathematical sciences. So, you know, in January of 2020, two plus two equals four. You know, in January of 2025, two plus two still equals four. But if you look at what we know about COVID now, the variants that have evolved, the, uh, the, the capability of the efficiency of its spread, the fact that asymptomatic people can spread the infection, that wasn't fully appreciated in the first few months, or at least the first few weeks of COVID. And things changed in that first six months to a year, that understandably confused many people and got them to be skeptical about science. Uh, and, and as a consequence, well, in general, some of these scientific debates are done within peer-reviewed journals, but you were doing the equivalent with COVID of changing a tire on a moving car. Right, exactly, exactly. And, you know, one of the problems that I, I think we're all very familiar with right now that we are living in, 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 an, in an era, an arena of uh, the, the rather substantial spread of mis- and disinformation uh, amplified tremendously by social media that when misinformation gets out there, the general public has a problem of being able to figure out what is true and what is not true because of the way misinformation and disinformation spread so rapidly through social media. This manifests itself in so many ways. One of my doctors was telling me that, uh, um, you know, even though we have the mechanisms now to prevent and care for and cure and mitigate diseases, even terrible catastrophic diseases, that it still hasn't gotten through in some ways. He was telling me about an anti-vaxxing patient of his who wondered whether the doctor himself had been vaxxed. And when the doctor said yes, he said, well, go home and take a refrigerator magnet and rub it on your arm and it'll suck the vaccine out. And so to have this kind of primitive belief in an age when so much information 
and so much technology and scientific solutions are at our disposal. What do you think accounts for that? Well, you know, like like I said, Pat, I, I think it's a combination of things, but a lot of it is the spread of mis and disinformation that is so rampant now. I mean, the, the, the example you gave can sound ludicrous, but it's true. You know, people were actually accusing Bill Gates and I of putting a chip in the vaccine and, and so that they could be monitored. And if you look at some people's statements on social media, it's that vaccines kill more people than the disease itself, which when you look at the actual scientific verified data that people who were vaccinated have a, a rather extraordinary lesser uh, incidence of getting hospitalization or death. I mean, the, the, the charts are really rather dramatic when you look at hospitalization and death among vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people. It sort of hits you like a Mack truck, the data. You can't deny it, but yet people still, because of the spread of misinformation and disinformation, sometimes actually believe that the vaccines cause more harm than the disease, which is absolutely crazy. As you pointed out in the book, you looked at just some numbers of deaths and serious complications from COVID in uh, more Republican states versus more Democratic states. And the difference was pronounced. And it's kind of alarming because this difference isn't just going to be remedied by better science classes in eighth grade. Yeah, that is really unfortunate. It's very painful uh, as a physician and a public health person for me to see that people on the basis of political ideology make a decision that has impact on their own health and the health of their family. Political ideology should have nothing to do with good public health principles. Good public health principles are immutable regardless of who you are or what your ideology is. And yet, as you said correctly, that the diminution of numbers of vaccines, relatively speaking, in red states versus blue states led to the phenomenon which is very unfortunate. And like I said, it's painful to me to see that there were more hospitalizations and deaths among people who live in red states than in blue states. That should never, ever have happened. And it isn't just COVID um, that this is now extended to. We see vaccine resistance and skepticism about the immensely contagious and very dangerous measles, for which, of course, there is a vaccine. Uh, and and the idea that, that people would say no to things that can save their lives. I remember watching the video of President Eisenhower giving an award to Jonas Salk, the uh, discoverer of the polio vaccine. And General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, just was choked up thinking of himself as a grandfather and all the children's lives that, that would be saved. And you wonder, how did we get from that to this? Well, that's one of my, my considerable concerns, Pat, is that the anti-vax feeling that we have in this country now, which is stronger than it's ever been could lead to a diminution in the acceptance of childhood vaccines such as measles and polio and mumps and pertussis and things like that. And we know historically, whenever there has been a diminution below a certain level of vaccinations for these childhood diseases, you have outbreaks of measles. I mean, there have been some countries that have suspended measles vaccinations temporarily, and you see a, a significant uptick in serious disease from measles, which is totally avoidable if people get vaccinated. One more question about the public health system, which is that one of the things we saw kind of laid bare during COVID or perhaps even created as a consequence of COVID is that uh, public officials and the public attacked public health figures. I'm not just talking about you, but the local health officials whose data is relied upon by the CDC to pass along information about uh, communicable and contagious diseases. People were hounded out of office, were scared or threatened out of office. What are your concerns about what's going to happen to public health service in this country if this thing persists, if people are, are disinclined to go into it, not because they're not interested, but because their lives are being threatened? 
Well, I, I think it's a reflection, Pat, of the profound divisiveness in our country. I mean, differences of opinion, uh, uh, diversity is fine in people's opinions about things, but if there ever was an unfortunate time to have an outbreak as serious as COVID would be at a time when there was a profound degree of divisiveness in the country. And that's what you're seeing. I mean, this, this backlash against people who are trying to preserve and protect the public health in general and the public health of individuals. I mean, so many of my colleagues uh, were subject to the same sort of pushback that I've experienced uh, personally, but many of my public health colleagues who were doing their best to save lives. It's, it's, it's extraordinary that they are often the object of, of vitriol against them, which just doesn't make any sense at all. Are you worried that people won't go into public health or? or well, yeah, I am. You know, I am. I think if you see people in your the profession that you're aspiring to enter, that you see the the kinds of, of pushback against them, threats on their family, people who are, you know, in the health field, in emergency rooms and trying to help people wind up being the object of scorn on the part of people. That is a big disincentive to enter the field of medicine, science, and public health. So I'm concerned that that is going to lead to a, a shortage of the kinds of people you need to respond appropriately to public health challenges. One of the um, matters that, uh, that has come to the fore is the question of the um, I don't know if you would call them, they're not orphan diseases, but exotic diseases like Ebola and how people seem to have an outsized fear of a disease, the likelihood of which they're getting is minimal. Um, uh, the, 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 some exotic ailment when, of course, the real risk to their health is the everyday, every year right. flu. Um, what do you think there is that accounts for that? That when you said Ebola and you write about this very compellingly in the book, that yes, it's dangerous. Yes, it can kill you, but it's not the risk that the everyday threat is. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Pat, because that's as you mentioned. I I, I discussed that in some detail uh, in in my memoir that there was more fear about Ebola spreading in the United States because we were bringing people who were volunteers, Americans who were volunteers, who were over in West Africa who accidentally got infected, we were taking care of them here. I personally, myself, took care of a couple of them in very strict containment facilities. And there was a concern that that's gonna mean we're gonna get an outbreak in the United States when people didn't fully appreciate that in order to spread Ebola, you have to have direct contact with the bodily fluids of a very sick person. So the chances of there being a major Ebola outbreak in the country are essentially zero. Not in West Africa, where the conditions of taking care of people, um, not anything near what you can have here in the United States. And yet the people were frightened, very much so, that we would have an Ebola outbreak in the United States which no matter how many times we were telling them that's not going to happen, there was still a lot of fear of that. So this is where the rational collides with the irrational and politics stirs the pot. Indeed, indeed. In fact, that's what we were trying to say, that, that, that fear spread more rapidly than Ebola in this country. That's for sure.